push record. Okay. Yeah, look, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is the third in our series of workshops to celebrate Open Education Week. And I want to welcome Kylie, Research Data Lead Librarian. That's an impressive title, Kylie. Yes, thank you. It's getting longer all the time. Oh, there you go. Does that mean you have to do more work? <laughs> I hope not, but it could be the case. <laughs> and, and Kylie is very gratefully and uh, generously sharing her time, and they're going to talk to us about the use of open data in education. So, um, yeah, over to you, Kylie. Great, thank you. Uh, well, hello, everybody. As Mitch has said, my name is Kylie Burgess. I'm the Research Data Lead Librarian in Dixon Library. So, more or less what that means is that I provide advice and training around research data management best practice um, to the entire UNE research community. So, today I thought in the spirit of Open Education Week, I'd talk talk a little bit about open data and tie it back to um, applications within the sphere of education and extend it out to OERs as well. So, hopefully, okay, great. So, I suppose um, a natural place to start today is to have a think about what we mean exactly by open data. Um, so here on the screen, I've got a couple of good definitions that are used quite widely. Um, and as you read through them, you'll note that free use, um, equitable access to information and themes around reuse are pretty common between the two of them. And I suppose the, the crux of that is that these are the main reasons why open data is an incredible resource for researchers and educators and people sort of more broadly in the OER and open space. So. You've probably heard about open data in the course of your work and you may have even worked with it in the past. But um, throughout today's little webinar, I thought I'd discuss some good uses for open data resources, um, how to find them, which is a pretty key thing, and what you might like to do with data that you've got of your own that you could make open down the track. So continuing on a little, I'm going to discuss the difference between open and fair. So these two terms are used together quite a lot and sometimes even interchangeably, but it's really important to know that they're not actually the same thing and that they often exist in the same space, but um, they're very separate ideas. So firstly, FAIR is, an, is a framework that was developed um, to make data sets more findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, the point of this really, the FAIR framework, is to seek a way to promote sharing and reuse of data. So in the course of our research and, and teaching or, or practice, we create data sets all the time. And a lot of them are very useful, not just for ourselves in the immediate project, but for other people as well. So FAIR really seeks to create a, a framework or a guide, if you like, to make data more oh. reusable. Um, the ideas around this have to do with things like metadata, good practice around describing data sets, making um, metadata machine readable so they can be picked up by aggregators uh, and places like Google so that they can become more findable, and also around making things more accessible for individuals um, who may not come from an academic background, perhaps they're um, community scientists or people with just a general interest in the research you're doing. So FAIR seeks to make open data sets more accessible and easier to engage with. So you can see that the framework is separate from open and um, you know it's the case sometimes that fair data sets are actually not open and open data sets are actually not fair they can be very hard to find sometimes and they may have very poor metadata they may be very difficult to reuse so these terms live together in a perfect world but they're not sort of wedded they can be very separate um, so now that we've got some key definitions out of the way we can get sort of to the meat and potatoes of today and have a talk about what we can do with open data in educational contexts, especially around OERs. So this is what we'll, the little roadmap of what we'll cover today. So we'll talk about how to actually find open data, which is a pretty useful thing to know how to do. We'll also talk about how we can create open data from your own research or teaching outcomes. And we'll look at how open data can support OERs um, and the power of linking all your research outputs together and what that actually means. So first of all, finding open data resources. 
Um, there are so many places you can go to find open data resources depending on who generates it and that's probably the hardest part about finding them is figuring out where they're going to be kept um, depending on who's created the data sets. So for government generated data your best places to turn are probably places like the Australian Bureau of Statistics or data.gov.au. These are really um, robust resources with a lot of data sets across a range of disciplines. Um, if you're wanting to get sort of more specifically focused on education or different sorts of data, perhaps environmental data and things like that, you can often benefit from going to the governmental department's website itself and looking for data on their websites. Sometimes this data is actually um, part of reports and things like that, which can make it a little bit harder to find at that sort of departmental level, but that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, bigger research institutes like CSIRO tend to have their own repositories, which you can access from their websites. So they're, if you're looking for data from those sort of organisations, they're often pretty easy to find, which is a bit of a, a boon. Um, institutional repositories like UNE's Rune are another good place to look, especially if you know that a particular institution is very strong in an area that you're interested in researching or working in. It can be really beneficial to go directly to their repository. And a lot of repositories have categories where you can go straight in and look at data sets so you, you don't have to search through a number of other research outputs to find the data sets, which is really useful. If you're looking for very discipline specific repositories, um, tools like Dryad can be useful. There's a lot of other discipline specific, um, I suppose, aggregators of, of repositories. And what I mean by that is they've gone through and curated a list of discipline specific repositories and put them all together in one place where you can search them. Another good place to go for this sort of thing is the registry of research data repositories. You can narrow down by discipline area on that website. It's a very helpful tool. Excuse me. Um, another great place to look is a, a larger sort of national based repository aggregator like ARDC's Research Data Australia. So what that website does is it brings all research repositories from uh, research institutions and universities in Australia and it harvests them pretty frequently about every month or so and brings all the new data sets into one place. So you can actually just search everything with some good keywords and find what you're looking for there. Um, organizations both for-profit and not-for-profit are a bit like government departments so you'll often find data on their website but often uh, it's embedded in research reports and things like that so it can be a little bit hard to tease out if you're not sure where they've put that information. Um, especially with not-for-profits they're very good at reporting their data so if you ever want to um, get data from organizations like that it's pretty easy to contact the person who's doing a lot of the reports and grab it that way um, and probably the last avenue is from individual researchers via things like Figshare um, you've probably all heard of Figshare and it can be a little bit difficult to navigate because it doesn't have the strict metadata um, standards that institutional repositories for example have so it can vary broadly in terms of quality of, of metadata. So that can make it very hard to find things in Figshare without a direct link. So I often say it's a last resort, but it can be useful in some cases. Okay, so now that we've got some options for where we could go to find open data sets, um, think about how we might use them in an educational context. So depending on what you're teaching or, or what your objectives are, you might be able to find open data sets to illustrate learning objects or learning outcomes. So a few examples that I've put together that I've seen used include using things like maps and typo typography graphs, uh, rainfall measurements, uh, animal density counting, things like that. A lot of this is from the CSIRO, CSIRO. Um, repository. So I use them as a good example because they've got very useful data sets on a broad range of things. You can use these tools to create learning objects or activities that people can engage with. Um, and it's a very hands-on 
um, process with this sort of thing. It's useful because um, digital literacy or data literacy is something that is required by most everyone this day, day and age in their work or their study, but it's actually a very underdeveloped skill. So there's a lot of great things you can do to engage learners with things like data visualization, um, using pretty simple websites where you can plug some data in, press a button about how you'd like it displayed, and it comes out in a really beautiful visual way that you can then sort of engage with more meaningfully. Another good use that I've seen is using historical court transcripts that are available on the um, federal court websites to give students an idea about how offences have been described or addressed through time and then compare that information with what they're finding in their current textbooks. So to really get an idea of that critical thinking, how are things changing? Um, does do things line up what the textbook says versus what the court cases are, are looking like uh, in terms of the transcript? So that's a really good way to use data in a teaching way. Open data, I think, can also be a really useful resource when you're creating your own OERs. So you can use them alongside more traditional research outputs like journal articles and books to substantiate your points. You could also use them to uh, create activities similar to the ones I've described that you could do in real time to put into your textbooks. That's a useful way to use some data sets. You can also use it to inform your own teaching practice. So a lot of times, especially uh, more recently, publishers have been requiring that data sets for accompanying publications be made accessible. So if you're looking at some practice journals or some um, more traditional research outputs like journal articles, you can often find the accompanying data to have a look and see how uh, what they're reporting on might be useful in your own teaching or practice. So that's a good, a good way to sort of trace back and have a look at how effective the things are that they're describing might be. And sort of on a broader, more management level, um, open data is really useful for helping educators um, make informed decisions about student and teacher cohorts. So you can get that broader level stuff from, um, you know, the New South Wales Department of Education, for example, about teaching outcomes based on practice and things like that. So that's another very useful use for some open data that's pretty easy to get your hands on. So why use open data in educational context or any context really in the first place? So there's obviously a lot of potentially useful applications for it, but the real value in it is that it's very accessible. Um, you don't require logins, you don't require payments or special access arrangements to get a hold of open data. Anybody can grab it, uh, you as a, as a teacher or a researcher or your students, if you set a task like that for them, can all access this equally. So the cost benefit is really good, i.e. it's free. The other benefit is that it's always available. So data sets generally have persistent identifiers, so things like DOIs or uh, persistent URLs like handle addresses. So you can grow and grab them at any time, find them again, um, down the track if you save that information and they don't go anywhere because they're in a repository in most cases and um, and those things don't go away. They're there for, for good and they're easy to reconnect with via the persistent identifiers. Obviously, as I've mentioned, the cost, open data sets are free, so teachers and learners can access them at no cost. And I know that this is a really big um, thing for learners, especially in terms of why OERs are so powerful in the learning um, in teaching space, you know, students have limited funds. And so being able to access these data sets if they're in part of activities or learning objects is really beneficial for them and for researchers too. The other great thing about data sets that are open is that they can be remixed. So data sets are often assigned a Creative Commons license, which allows you to remix data sets. You can add them together, you can split them apart, you can use sections and not use other sections. As long as you're following the requirements of that Creative Commons license, you can pretty much do what you like with an open data set. And that's very useful as well. So keeping all of that in mind, we can now think about what you might like to do with your own data. So if you're a researcher who's creating data sets, you might like to think about contributing to the open data set space.
sorry, I was muted. Is that okay? Can you hear me again? Yeah, Great. Sorry, I'm I'm a bit wheezy today from all the grass being cut around the house. So <laughs> I think a bit of a struggle. Um, a thank you. Yeah, just powering through. Uh, yeah. So creating your own data. Um, if you're a researcher and you are creating uh, more traditional research outputs like journal articles or even OERs as well, you probably are creating data sets. And it's a really powerful thing to think about how you can take your data that you've got on somewhere like Cloud UNE and make it an open data set and contribute to this really rich environment of sharing research with everybody else sort of globally. So there's a lot of reasons why open data sets and sharing your data openly is valuable to you as a researcher. So a lot of people are motivated by that individual um, benefit. So here are some individual benefits for why sharing open data is really good for you as a researcher. It gives you a lot of extra opportunities for people to engage with your work. So if you're publishing data sets openly and you've got more traditional research outputs like journal articles that sort of go to uh, green open access down the track, it gives people a way to engage with your work immediately uh, and sort of, you know, they can they can use it as a tool for connecting with you, perhaps collaborating with you if, you if that's something that they're interested in, if they're in a like area of research. It's a great way for people to find you and engage with you and perhaps even end up collaborating with you with work down the track. It's another measurable impact and engagement metric, just like journal articles with data sets in repositories. We can count the number of interactions around downloads, um, alt metrics, so things like are people tweeting about your research data sets? Are they sharing it on social media or via other avenues? These are all really valuable to you as a researcher to demonstrate how people are interacting with your research. It's also really valuable to connect your research outputs, your open data research outputs with your researcher profile. So things like your ORCID, um, perhaps your Google Scholar and things like that. It's another means for you to show all the feathers in your cap as a researcher, if you like. And the good news is that making open data sets is actually pretty straightforward. It's, uh, it's simply a matter of contacting if you're at UNE Rune and we can walk you through the process. It's very quick and easy and uh, it requires very little effort on your part to start making these research outputs available, not just to people in your own sort of uh, specialty or discipline, but more widely to people who are creating other open resources like OERs or putting the data together into learning activities like I described before. So to put everything together, uh, with some useful links and resources here. Uh, these are things that you might like to have a look at that sort of spruik the value of open data in educational contexts and talk about more broadly how to do these kind of things with the ARDC links. But I think the sort of the crux of it is where, where do we go to from here? So we can see that there's some value in open data and definitely some useful applications when it comes to open education resources and teaching more generally. So I think, you know, for all of you who've come along today, have a think about if you've got some data sets that you can make open. And if you do, contact Rune to get that done and also contact your librarian to talk about linking it to your research output profiles. It's very valuable and, it, and I think increasingly measures of research excellence will start to look at data sets um, as another metric, just like they do with things like NTROs um, and more traditional research outputs like journal articles. So if you can get ahead of the curve on that, I think it'd be very useful to you as a researcher down the track. Another thing you could do is find ways to utilize open data resources when creating your own OERs. So if Open Education Week has inspired you to start looking at how you can create and share some OERs, have a think about how open data sources might be able to enrich those learning objects for you. And, you know, have a think about how you could use open data to inform your pro professional practice and research. So I know um, a lot of you are probably in the teaching and learning space and you're always looking for innovative ways to do things. And traditionally you might find that in, um, you know, trade uh, journals or journal articles published by people who are using new teaching and learning um, methodologies. Have a look at the data as well and see how you can use that to implement and change your own practice and sort of push things forward a little bit uh, yourself. 
So that pretty much concludes the spruiking part of today. So I'd like to encourage any of you who've got any questions or, or any comments about what you're doing in the open data space to please feel free to engage here today and we can we can discuss that together. Great job, Carly. Well done. Yeah, I mean, what I think excites me about the opportunity of open data is getting students to use it because all, all often they're just dealing with the, with the with the product that somebody else is thinking when they see the tabulated data. But if they've got the raw data, they've got to deal with issues like, well, what do you do with missing data? That's how right. are we going to analyze it? How are we going to present it? You know, and, and one of those great opportunities where we actually get students to actually work on the process instead of getting to the product. So look, yeah, you did a great job, very comprehensive. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I also think it's it's a great, it's great to think about the skills that learners are going to need, I think, in, you know, a couple of years from now and probably immediately right now and and things like data literacy and digital literacy are huge and I just don't know that um, I think that there's always more we can do to enrich people's learning experience with those skills and there's so many free tools available online where you can plug in an, an open data set and have people play around with data and get to understand how you might visualize it or how you might analyze it it's just there's so many resources available and it's just a really rich learning opportunity i think absolutely yeah and i know with um you know our, um uh, human research ethics process now you know there's a, a very big one of the questions is will your data be made open so that that's a positive right. to see as well so. yeah that's right yeah and i think you know uh, there's definitely really good reasons why some data sets can't be made open but they can definitely be made fair so you could definitely um, have the metadata available in a repository like rune and have it be very discoverable and then people can negotiate access to part or all of that via you and you can make decisions about that yourself so if you feel like you've got data sets that you can't make open for privacy reasons or similar, do think about making them fair um, and getting them out there in that way. Okay. All right, just throw open to the floor if anyone's got any questions or comments, uh, please. You can either uh, talk or, or, or chat. Hi, Helen Ware here. Um, I have a refugee unit where I get students to select a country from which refugees come and then see all the data they can find about that country um, concerning refugees. And there are some fantastic uh, resources. Uh, all students think that the World Bank is the devil, but if you're looking for data, it certainly isn't. It's a wonderful resource and they, they let you establish your own table, table formats and the rest of it and so on. Uh, and there's also an immense multiplicity of data available for for things like from things like the UNHCR and the displaced persons data registry and there's there's too much data not, not too too little so um and you're quite right most students are a bit dumbfounded to be asked to go and actually play with data yeah, yeah absolutely no there's some just wonderful resources out there for open data and I think increasingly um, you know there's a movement to thinking about open data and so as we see more of that I think the problem will be as you say there's going to be so much more of it it'll be navigating it more than finding it which will be a good problem to have I suppose. I know another great source is the um, of all things the CIA World Factbook. You think yeah, the CIA, yeah. CIA knows everybody's business? Yes, it does. You know, if you want to know the number of un, you know how many kilometres of unpaved roads in Guana, that's you know that's the place you go. Uh, yeah, very comprehensive. Any other comments or thoughts? Um, All right, well, we might wrap things up. As, um, and look, Kylie, what great job. And, okay, and yeah, great. true librarian tradition, you just powered on despite this. So, well done. Um, yeah. Uh, just one question here. Yeah, please. Uh, so, for example, my when uh, I finished my PhD, I decided to uh, put a restriction on my PhD because of some specific methods, but um, I'm happy with it that with my data to be open the resource. So how can I do that? Right, so 
all you really need to do is contact me or the Rune team. Mm -hmm. And it's a really simple matter of if you've ever made a submission to Rune for something like a journal article or an NTRO or similar, it's pretty much exactly the same process, except instead of updating, uploading rather, um, you know, a public publisher's version of the journal article, you would just upload your data. Um, it, it asks all the same questions regarding metadata and if there's anything missing, we, we audit everyone so I can be in contact to get any missing metadata. But it really is just a matter of progressing through the rune form and attaching the data as required. So it's pretty straightforward. And then we can meet you a DOI and there'll be a persistent identifier URL for your data set. So it'll be very findable and very accessible um, from there. Okay. Well, thank you, Carly. My pleasure. I, I look forward to an email. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Thank you. Great. And if anybody's got any questions after the fact, or if you think of something down the track, please feel free to contact me. Um, you can tell that I love talking about data, so I'd be more than happy to assist with any questions or inquiries you have. So, Carly, just to Google here, just so anything uh, relating to Rune in this context, we can contact you directly, is okay? Yeah, if it's, if it's to do with data, then absolutely contact me directly. If it's to do yeah. with things more like journal articles, you can contact Rune. But yes, I'm happy to talk to you about any aspect of, of data, whether it be in relation to Rune or otherwise. So feel free to email. Thank Great. Okay. okay. All right. So we might wrap it up there. Thanks, Kylie. Very good. Kylie. Thanks. Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Kylie. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you, Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you. And just remember, tomorrow we'll be looking at the final workshop. We'll be looking at developing your own educational, open educational resources. So we hope you can join us uh, again tomorrow. And thanks for everyone for supporting these uh, these seminars. We're very grateful. All right, you have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.